is it safe? Okay, and I, and I just put this in here again. I think most of you guys know, uh, but I put this in here so just to give you some information, uh, again, as a, as a representative of the industry, that you can, you know, talk in an informed way to others when these issues come up. So the two big ones are groundwater contamination and earthquakes, or uh, we use the words induced seismicity, right? So uh, these are, uh, you know, these are these are the sort of hotbed political issues. This is what you hear about. In fact, I, I, I saw, I didn't read the article, uh, but I saw a, a on my Twitter feed earlier, <laughs> I, I saw a, 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 just a headline from PBS Nova program that, that uh, supposedly frack chemicals were found in the drinking water in Pennsylvania. I didn't read the article, I don't know. But it turns out that most of frack chem I don't know how they know it came from, I mean, it's, it's very hard to say that it came from fracture because most of the chemicals are household chemicals that could have came from anywhere. But, so maybe I should read the article before I say anything more about it. But the point is, it's a very, you know, hot, hotbed item. Thing. So, you know, first with respect to fractured fluids, again, m most of the fractured fluids you can find in your house, right? Um, uh, slick water is 98% water. And in fact, I, there, was a, there was a forum a couple of years ago where uh, one of the a lead engineer for one of the fracture companies actually drank a glass. Did you all hear about that? He actually drank a glass of slick water, um, you know, on and to, to, to sort of make a public statement. Um, a lot of the, the operators are have voluntarily uh, put up this fractfocus.org website and are voluntarily uh, putting their chemical registries there, so that people, you know, residents that live in the area can see what types of chemicals are being used. Um, there's also probably new regulation coming that's going to force. So most of the stuff that's been up, put up there to date has been voluntary, but it's likely that new regulations will force operators to participate in this uh, chemical disclosure registry. Um, again, I think most of you guys know this, but just the scale, right? Uh, Again, the Eagle Ford is the, the play that I'm most familiar with. That's why I keep referring to it. But in the Eagle Ford, the pay zone is between 4,000 feet at the high side and down to about 4, 14,000 feet. So it's quite a big, quite a big uh, uh, difference, it's, and it's a huge play. Uh, but, but nevertheless, you know, your fresh water that you drink when you drill a well is somewhere on the order of 500 feet, usually. And there's many, many dense seals between uh, where the uh, where the horizontal leg is and the groundwater. And and those of you who take, I mean, you've all taken drilling, so you know that. I mean, the first thing you do is you drill down below the freshwater aquifers, the set casing, and cement it back to the surface, right? And what's you know, I don't, I don't know if you guys have. I'm sure, you, again, you probably know, but. When operators first began to do this, they did it voluntarily. No one told them they had to set cur surface casing. They did it voluntarily to protect the reservoir from the water. Right? They, you know, no no one has any more interest in having more water in their oil, in their oil and gas than 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 oil and gas in the water, right? Because you got to take it out to sell it. And so, uh, so again, you know. The surface casing is set away up here, and, and the operations where the fractures are being conducted. Uh, now, fractures, the, the fracture heights themselves, I mean, we can do the mechanical analysis to know, like, how the heights are limited. Due to, uh, and, and particularly when you have dense seals. When you have dense seals, uh, you're, you're going to have typically a higher Young's modulus, higher toughness material. And, the f you know, fracturing, as we'll see in a minute, is sort of a... It's a it's an energy minimization problem, and, and you know when fractures propagate, they're going to want to propagate in the w way that it takes the least action to do it, right? And so, uh, fractures will almost always be height limited by some dense seal or above, or just uh, height li limited by the amount of pressure that you can pump. And and, and so, uh, you know I think you know this, but the fractures are a long long way from your 
from your drinking water. And now that's not to say that there's not other issues, good cement jobs and other things, right? But in terms of, you know, if we confine our discussion of hydraulic fracturing to the producing of the fractures themselves, right? There's really no danger in groundwater contamination. Right? There's a dr danger in groundwater contamination from truck traffic and sort of all these other things that are general. It doesn't matter if you're hydraulic fracturing the well or not, right? No matter how you complete it, these are kind of general issues. Cement jobs, surface casing, all this stuff are, are sort of issues that are associated with any well, not specific to hydraulic fracturing. And so in the Marcellus, you know, this is in Pennsylvania and Ohio and up that way, where you, you sort of hear the loudest noise about, you know, and there's the famous movie Gasland, right, where the people lit their, lit their uh, tap on fire, right, where, you know, they could have done that 40 years ago before anybody was hydraulic fracturing. I mean, there's, there's sort of eternal flames in that area, you know, where the natural gas methane leaks to the surface and you can, you can light them all the time, right? So uh, in, in Marcellus, where, um, where a lot of the noise is being made about the contamination of drinking water, and, and in fact, the Nova story I was referring to earlier was in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, here's your, here's your water table. So this is all below, all above, rather, 1,000 feet. And here's where the fracture treatments occurred. And the, these are the, the maximum vertical heights of the fractures as we can best attain them from microseismics, which we'll talk about in a second. All right. So, you know, in the sort of the, the worst case scenario, there's still 5,000 feet between the water and the fractures. Uh, this is the other big one. Does hydraulic fracture produce earthquakes? What's the answer? Yes. Yes, they do. Can you feel them at the surface? Again, let's confine our discussion of hydraulic fracturing to the production of the fractures themselves, not what we do with wastewater or anything like that, right? Can you feel them at the surface? No. And we have a lot of data to show that too. So uh, these are these are moment magnitude plots from the Eagle Ford. Um, you know, as a reference, so this is all negative, right? So this is zero here. As a reference, a plus three, which would be over here, where none of them are, a plus three would be something that you could slightly feel at the surface. And this is like a you know, moment magnitude plots are or is a log scale. It's like a Richter magnitude, right? So Something that is a three is not three times larger than zero. It's 30,000 ti 30, times larger than zero, right? So the, 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 the highest one here at a depth of 12,000 feet was almost zero. So the, the smallest thing that you could noticeably feel on the surface is 30,000 times larger than the largest thing that was measured, right? And so these are microseismics. These, these come from slip, inducing slip, right? Uh, on the natural fractures and otherwise shear failures in the rock. So uh, as we're propagating natural fractures and activating all these natural fractures, they slip, produce a tiny little earthquake that you can only hear with a geophone and a test well or you know, something very precision instrument you know, made to, to measure these things. Okay, so of course, the stuff you hear about in, with respect to earthquakes in Oklahoma and stuff has to do with injecting wastewater. Okay. So those are wastewater injection wells. And you know when you have uh, one isolated location that you're injecting wastewater from every fracture job that's going on in the whole state of Oklahoma, and you do it for months and months and months and months and months and months and months, and months eventually you're going to raise the pore pressure and you're going to induce induce some seismicity or you know, create a, a noticeable fee, you know, earthquake that you can feel. Um, it's not that we, you know, we shouldn't discount this. We should do something uh, to prevent this because there's no small earthquake when it's your house that's shaking. Right? And so people do live here and we want to minimize the impact. But I mean, we could do things to correct it. We, we, first of all, we don't inject that much water into one location for that long a time. It's simple. 
so we could use more injection wells. Uh, we can also recycle. Uh, and in certain plays, um, I think when George King was here last week, uh, he mentioned that uh, at Apache in the Permian Basin, they are recycling 100% of their frack water. But the recycling plant, uh, and, and, and doing it at a cost that's cheaper than purchasing it. Uh, but the recycling plant, you, it's only cheaper because of the scale. So you can really only do these kind of things in, in areas where it's very, very dense uh, amount of o operations going on, like in the Permian Basin, like in Eagle Ford. Then you could do it on a scale to get the cost down that it's cheaper than buying it. Um, you know, for up in, up in uh, Pennsylvania for many years, uh, they simply put the fr put the frack water in the rivers because the you know, contaminants, part per million contaminants in the rivers, are h far higher <laughs> than what's in the frack water, uh, and so they were they were lower. Now this was before sort of everything blew up, and you know now they have more regulations. And they truck a lot of the water from Pennsylvania to Ohio because there are no injection wells in Pennsylvania. So they actually truck a lot of the a lot of the wells, a lot of the wastewater to Ohio to be injected. And so in that sort of regulation environment, it's almost forcing people to to recycle. Not necessarily because of the cost. Because there's a lot more water in Pennsylvania. The water's a lot cheaper. There's a lot more fresh water in Pennsylvania, so it would be cheaper to just buy it than recycle it. But you know, out in the Permian Basin, not quite a few plentiful rivers out there. Really. So anybody from West Texas? Yeah. I, I lived out there for a while. It's, no, it's you know, it's very desolate, but uh, I, I still sort of have fond memories of it. They're very nice people all over. Uh, West Texas. Very nice people everywhere. Anyway. So, okay, so that's sort of the high level overview, uh, which, you know, provides some, some back, background information. I, I hope there was something in there maybe that you didn't know. I suspect that a lot of you knew this stuff, maybe even because it's the reason you went into the, into the field. I mean, you guys are young enough that you, you chose your major in college after all this started, right? And so it, it probably has a lot to do with, with why you decided to be a petroleum engineer.